This is 36-year-old white supremacist Travis McMichael, along with his 66-year-old father, Greg McMichael, and William Roddy Bryan, who has been convicted of slaying Ahmad Arbery. Together with his fellow assailants, this white supremacist was charged with one count of malice murder, three counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, one count of false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit a felony. For our viewers at home who may not understand what these charges mean, I'm going to break it down for you. A malice murder is when a person, unlawfully and with malice aforethought, either express or implied, causes the death of another human being. No evidence of premeditation is required. Felony murder applies when someone who has no plans to kill intentionally commits another felony and a person dies as a result. The other charges of aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit a felony would be highlighted as this case gets explained. Father and son, Greg and Travis McMichael grabbed their Remington shotgun and a .357 Magnum revolver, respectively, and went on a pursuit in their pickup truck after seeing the 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery running in their neighborhood in the Georgia port city of Brunswick. Their neighbor, William Roddy Bryan, decided to join in on the pursuit while he recorded with his cell phone. For about five minutes, the three defendants chased Mr. Arbery relentlessly through the neighborhood and tried to box him in with their trucks. This is where the false imprisonment charge comes from. False imprisonment involves detaining a person against his will and may be most commonly thought of in a scenario where someone is held in a room or other enclosed space. In this case, prosecutors say the three men used the trucks to unlawfully confine and detain Arbery when they chased him through their neighborhood. During the chase, Mr. Arbery was running with his hands empty and in plain view. He never uttered a word to the three defendants and didn't make any threatening sound or gesture. Rather, he repeatedly just tried to run away from the defendants. Ultimately, after Mr. Arbery had already changed direction multiple times trying to escape from the defendants, Travis McMichael got out of his truck and pointed the Remington shotgun directly at Mr. Arbery. When Mr. Arbery attempted to defend himself, Travis McMichael shot him in the chest. Mr. Arbery, wounded, attempted to reach for the gun. During a tussle over the gun, Travis McMichael fired two more shots into Mr. Arbery, who stumbled a few steps and collapsed face first onto the pavement, where he died in the street. The first aggravated assault charge stems from the fact that Arbery was assaulted with the 12-gauge shotgun that was used to kill him, while the second alleges an assault using the two trucks, one driven by Travis McMichael and the other driven by Brian. The indictment mentions that pickup trucks, when used offensively against a person, are likely to result in serious bodily injury. The federal jury convicted the McMichaels and Brian of violating Mr. Arbery's civil rights, insisting that they targeted him because of his race. All three defendants were also found guilty of attempted kidnapping. Evidence at trial revealed that the defendants had strongly held racist beliefs that led them to make assumptions and decisions about Mr. Arbery that they would not have made if Mr. Arbery had been white. Travis McMichael's presence on social media, as well as text messages to friends, showed that he had associated black people with criminality for many years and had expressed a constant desire to see black people, especially those he viewed as criminals, harmed or killed, and that he had expressed support for vigilante efforts to catch or harm them. The judge delivered a powerful speech to the courthouse before sentencing all three defendants. In this case, getting back to the video, again, after Amarda Arbery fell, the McMichaels turned their backs. It's, a, again, a disturbing image, and they walked away. This was a killing. It was callous. All three defendants faced sentences of up to life in state prison. This caused Travis McMichael to fear for his life. His lawyer told the court his client had received hundreds of threats, and forcing him to serve the time in a Georgia state prison would essentially amount to a death penalty that could leave McMichael vulnerable to vigilante justice. This level of irony is thicker than the hide of a rhino. A white supremacist being scared of getting lynched is absolutely hilarious. Gregory McMichael's attorney made a similar request West, but argued the 66-year-old should be kept in federal custody for his health. Prosecutors opposed both requests, and the judge agreed and denied the requests. He then continued with his sentencing. Mr. McMichael, the court sentences you as follows. Count one, malice murder, life without the possibility of parole. Count two, felony murder, is vacated by operation of law. Count three, felony murder, vacated by operation of law,
These are the facial reactions made by the defendants during the sentencing. Who would have thought that these three cold-blooded killers would have an ounce of remorse in their skin? I'm confident that the sadness on show here is because they're about to be shipped to jail, and not because of the 25-year-old they killed. The judge kept on reading the counts, all the way to number 9. Count 8, false imprisonment, merges into count 1. Count 9, attempted false imprisonment, 5 years concurrent to count seven. That is life plus 20. Travis McMichaels was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, plus an additional 30 years. His father, Greg McMichaels, was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, plus 27 years. Their neighbor, William Bryan, was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 30 years, with an additional 35 years. Welcome to the Multnomah County Courthouse for the arraignment of 40-year-old white supremacist Russell Orlando Courtier, who has been accused of racial malice in driving into and killing African-American teenager Larnell Bruce Jr. He was charged with murder, second-degree intimidation, hit-and-run driving, and failure to perform duties as a driver. This hate crime represented Oregon's first hate crime murder conviction in three decades. Courtier is a member of a gang called European Kinder which is a white supremacist prison gang based primarily in the Oregon Correction System. He joined in 2003 and had the gang's initials and logo tattooed onto one of his legs. On the day of the incident, Russell Courtier was wearing a European kindred cap with the initials of the hate group and its emblem prominently showcased on the front when he encountered 19-year-old Larnell Bruce Jr. at the convenience store. Official reports stated that Courtier and Bruce were involved in an altercation in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven convenience store in Gresham, Oregon, just outside of Portland. For reasons that are still unknown, Courtier and Bruce got into a fist fight, with witnesses stating that Bruce had the upper hand in the fight, and that became clear after Bruce slammed Courtier into a store window, breaking it. Courtier then retrieved an aerosol can from the Jeep that he had parked nearby, with Bruce pulling out a machete of his own, according to witness accounts. Though it appeared that Courtier didn't use the aerosol can, and Bruce didn't use the machete as well. Deciding to be the bigger man, Bruce walked away while Courtier got in the jeep and followed him. With both men going their separate ways initially, Courtier and his then-girlfriend Colleen Hunt were in a jeep wrangler driven by Courtier when he was encouraged by Hunt to chase and fatally strike Bruce with the SUV. Police responded to a call about a hit-and-run involving a pedestrian and found Larnell Bruce suffering from fatal injuries. Bruce later died of those injuries at a nearby hospital. Prosecutor David Hannon tells the jurors this in his opening statement. Russell Cortier hunted and chased Arnell Bruce with his girlfriend's large red Jeep not once but twice. He continued to talk about how Cortier took a cool, efficient, and lethal action in ending Larnell Bruce's life. He intended to kill Mr. Bruce again not once but as the video showed, you twice. He accomplished that goal with cold, efficient, and lethal action behind the wheel of that red jeep. During the trial, Hannon called Courtier violent and unapologetic for his white supremacist views. The prosecution said Courtier, who joined the white supremacy group European Kindred while incarcerated, was a racist who made no secret about his beliefs within his circle. Prosecutor David Hammond said, quote, Russell Courtier's membership with the European Kindred gang was not out of necessity. Instead, it stemmed from his racist desire to be a part of a brotherhood. Courtier's defense attorneys, Kevin Solly and John Rob contended that Larnell Bruce just suddenly started punching and beating Courtier out of the blue without any provocation on that fateful night. They insisted Courtier had just driven up to the 7-Eleven at 188th Avenue in East Burnside with his girlfriend to hang out, but Hannon said there was zero evidence that Bruce started the fistfight outside the convenience store. He said that witnesses in surveillance videos report Bruce peacefully standing outside the store for minutes until Courtier drove up and parked, then suddenly a fight was on. This is what Courtier's defense attorney, Kevin Solly, had to say. Well, neither Mr. Courtier nor Ms. Hunt knew that night that they drove toward the 7-Eleven. Was it there waiting at the store? It was a group of people who were about to set in motion a series of events of catastrophic consequences. 
All 12 jurors agreed Courtier was guilty of the count of murder and also the count of failing to perform the duties of a driver. Two objected to the intimidation charge, but Courtier was still convicted on the split jury verdict. Oregon is the only state where someone can be convicted without a unanimous vote on any felony charge other than murder. His then-girlfriend Colleen Hunt had pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter during Courtier's trial. She agreed to accept a 10-year sentence after admitting to aiding and abetting Courtier in causing Larnell Bruce Jr.'s death by allowing him to use her Jeep Wrangler SUV. Courtier teared up in court, but did not speak during the sentencing because his lawyer said they advised him against doing so. The judge sentenced him to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 28 years. He was already serving a four-year sentence for his role in a previous 2015 bar attack, and he will serve his latest sentence on top of the four-year term, bringing his total prison time before possible parole to 32 years. Hate crimes are not limited to white-on-black violence. Sometimes it can be reversed, with the hate crime being perpetrated by a black individual on a white individual. And in Fresno County Superior Court, 39-year-old Muhammad Corey, he was arrested for his radically motivated shooting rampage in Fresno, resulting in the deaths of white men he targeted randomly on the street. He was charged with one first-degree murder charge, three second-degree murder charges, two counts of assault with a deadly weapon, three counts of attempted murder murder for the individuals he shot at but didn't hit, one count of shooting at an occupied vehicle, and one count of possession of a firearm. On April 18, 2017, a racially motivated shooting spree occurred in Fresno, California, leaving three white people dead. The gunman, Corey Muhammad, a self-proclaimed black supremacist, said he went on his shooting spree because of his hatred for white people, and particularly white men. Corey had a long criminal history and filled his social media feeds with posts about reparations, black separatism, and white devils. Before engaging in the shooting spree, about five days prior, he visited a motel called Motel 6 in central Fresno, California. Corey happened to be visiting a woman who had checked into one of the rooms. Since motel policy demanded all visitors to provide some form of identification at the office, an unarmed security guard, identified as Carl Williams, went to the room to inform Corey and the woman of this. While the guard was escorting Corey, and the woman to the motel office, a quarrel erupted between the guard and the woman. As the guard conversed with the woman, Corey took a few steps away from the guard and then immediately turned around and pulled out his weapon. Corey fired multiple shots of his handgun at the unsuspecting guard, effectively killing him at close range. According to reports, the murderer escaped the officers at the motel by fleeing to a nearby 7-Eleven and hiding out on the store rooftop. The next morning, he got off of the rooftop, went to a nearby school, and and hit by a dumpster. Over the weekend, he changed his entire appearance by cutting his hair and traveled around central Fresno. Four days after, while out to purchase items to use for his rituals, Corey went to a Starbucks coffee shop and saw himself identified as a suspect on the television. After seeing himself on television identified as a suspect in William's murder, Corey told himself that he would not go down for one murder and that he would take out as many white men as possible. Hours later, several shootings were reported in downtown Fresno. Corey fired off 17 shots in total, shooting and killing three men, shooting at and missing another three men, and shooting at a vehicle with passengers inside. All of his victims were white men. Corey first approached a utility truck and fired four shots into it, fatally wounding an employee seated in the passenger seat. The passenger of the vehicle was identified to be Zachary Randalls. The driver of that truck was spared from being shot, since he was deemed Hispanic and non-white by Corey. The driver drove away unharmed and took Randalls to the Fresno Police Department headquarters, where he alerted officers. Zachary Randalls was taken to Community Regional Medical Center, where he later died. Minutes after the first series of shootings, Corey spotted a man, Mark Gassett, walking out of a building and shot him once in the chest. He then killed him with two more shots after he'd fallen to the ground. Corey then reloaded at a bus stop and fired shots at three white men. Two of them got away unscathed, but Corey chased the third man, David 
David Jackson. Corey followed Jackson, who unfortunately happened to be the heaviest and oldest of the three white men. Corey cornered him into the parking lot and fired six shots, two that killed Jackson, two that struck parked vehicles, one that struck a nearby building, and a sixth that was apparently never recovered. Witnesses reported that Corey shouted obscenities as he fired. When he made his first court appearance for the murder of all four of his victims, he shouted strange sentences on different occasions, such as, quote, let black people go. He also warned the courthouse that natural disasters plaguing the U.S. will increase. As a result of these weird statements, criminal proceedings were suspended, and the judge ordered a psychiatric evaluation for Corey. Let black people go with our own land and reparations, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell. His defense attorney also leaned into the theatrics of his client and stated that Corey is mentally unstable and could not have premeditated those murders. We have a confused, mentally ill man not deliberating, not considering, acting impulsively, and unable to premeditate. Corey, however, testified in court that he shot and murdered Carl Williams of his own volition. He testified that he later went on a shooting spree and shot and killed Zachary Randalls, Mark Gassett, and David Jackson, and shot at three other white men. Corey confessed that he was trying to kill as many white men as he could. When asked why he shot Mark Gassett while he lay on the ground wounded from the previous shots, Corey proudly admitted that his intention was to kill him, just like the coronavirus is killing white men. During the sentencing, Corey was seen to be full of laughter and giggles. Perhaps he was still proud of what he accomplished for the so-called white devils. Besides the laughter and giggles, he was also seen unapologetically blowing kisses and grinning at the entire courthouse, a sign of a psychopath with very little remorse for his actions. Corey was convicted of the second-degree murder of Carl Williams, Mark Gassett, and Zachary Randalls, and was convicted of the first-degree murder of David Jackson, with special circumstances pertaining to hate crime on race, as well as four attempted second-degree murders. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Mr. Gendron, please stand. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. Welcome to Buffalo City Court, where 19-year-old gunman Peyton Gendron has been accused of targeting and killing 10 black people and injuring three others at a Buffalo, New York grocery store. Peyton Gendron was charged on the state level with one count of domestic terrorism in the first degree, 10 counts of first-degree murder, 10 counts of second-degree murder as a hate crime, three counts of attempted second-degree murder as a hate crime, and one count of second-degree criminal possession of a weapon. On the federal level, he was charged charged with 26 federal hate crimes and other firearm offenses. Gendron described himself in his 180-page manifesto as an ethno-nationalist and a supporter of white supremacy who is motivated to commit acts of political violence. He voiced support for the far-right Great Replacement conspiracy theory in the context of a white genocide. The shooting has been described as an act of domestic terrorism and is being investigated as a hate crime that was motivated by anti-black racism racism and white supremacy, just like how the KKK operates. In the afternoon of that tragic day, Gendron arrived at the top supermarket on Jefferson Avenue in Buffalo, New York, in a predominantly black neighborhood as he targeted. He was armed with a Bushmaster XM-15 AR-15 style rifle and multiple 30-round ammunition magazines. In his car, he had a Savage Arms Axis XP hunting rifle and a Mossberg 500 shotgun. He was wearing full body armor a military-style helmet, and a head-mounted camera, through which he live-streamed the entire shooting on the online platform Twitch. As he approached the scene, he was recorded on his live stream saying, just gotta go for it. Gendron shot four people in the parking lot, killing three. He then got into the store and shot eight more people, killing six. According to reports from a law enforcement source, he yelled racial slurs during the incident. Many employees and customers hid in the store's break room and barricaded the 
door with a heavy desk. At some point, an armed security guard, Aaron Salter Jr., shot at him, but due to the shooter's full body armor, the bullets did not stop him. Gendron fired back at Salter, who died at the scene. At another point, he aimed his gun at a white person behind a counter, but immediately apologized and decided not to shoot. Six minutes after the shooting started, Gendron went to the front of the building, where officers were able to talk him into dropping his gun. A total of 60 shots were fired during the shooting. After his arrest, he made unsettling statements regarding his motive and psyche. 13 people, 11 of them black and 2 white, were shot that day, 10 of which were fatally wounded. All 10 who died were black. A mere 5 days after the incident, a felony hearing was scheduled to begin in front of a grand jury. He was held without bail under suicide watch. During the trial, a document of Gendron's was uncovered by investigators and said, The goals behind the attack, which were to kill as many African Americans as possible, avoid dying, and spread ideals. The document also detailed the defendant's hateful beliefs, especially his hatred for African Americans, Jewish people, immigrants, and other minorities. Emotions were very high during the sentencing of Peyton Gendron. One of the victim's families disrupted the court by lunging directly at the Buffalo gunman in anger. Before Peyton Gendron learned of his sentence, he heard from the victim's family members. The value of a black human meant nothing to him. They spoke of their grief, pain, and anguish. Because of you murdering my dad, I'm pissed and I'm sad, and I hate you. During the hearing, the 19-year-old apologized for his crimes. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. Judge Susan Egan wasted no time and handed down his sentence, and his reaction is somewhat remorseful. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. Gendron is sentenced to life without parole, New York's highest sentence for pleading guilty to first-degree domestic terror. Gendron was the first person in the history of New York State to be found guilty of that charge. Gendron also faces several unresolved federal charges that could warrant the death penalty. If you enjoyed this video, check out our other awesome courtroom videos on the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.